Hi everybody, this is Dr. Dalton from Hammond Chiropractic and I'm really excited to be making this video for you today because this is the first video I'll be doing for 2020. Now I've got a really good topic for you today, but let me start by telling you that I always tell you guys I get my very best ideas for what to talk about on these videos while I'm driving to the gym early in the morning. I don't know why that is, maybe it's because I have nothing better to do but to think, but for some reason my ideas come to me then. And I drive half an hour each way to my gym, so I've got a little bit of time and I like to use that time to try to learn something. So I'm either listening to an educational CD or recently what I've really been using a lot is Audible. And I'm listening to this book right now that's really, really been good. It's by a man, his name is Dr. Joe Dispenza, who's a chiropractor. And the book that I'm, re I'm listening to, it's called Becoming Supernatural. And it's absolutely fascinating. He actually became famous uh, because he was in a movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? And if you've never seen that before, I would strongly recommend that too. It's really, really interesting. But this book, I mean, he's really talking about some things that are fascinating to me. And he was talking in the chapter that I was listening to the other day about this topic that I thought, oh, I've got to talk about this. I mean, it was just so interesting because it reminded me of how absolutely amazing the human body really is and how fascinating it is that all of this is functioning without us even thinking about it. But not only that, but the body is constantly adapting to its environment. And so um, I'm going to be talking to you about what he was saying, but I have to give you a little bit of an anatomy lesson before we go into that for this to make sense. So the very first thing I want to talk to you about is blood. Let's talk about what the function or the purpose of blood is. Well, blood is essentially a transporter. And what its job is, is that it basically, as it travels through the lungs, it picks up oxygen. And as it goes through the digestive system, it picks up nutrients. And it takes those things out to all the different cells of the body that need those to function properly. Now, at the same time, the cells of your body, as they work, they produce metabolic byproducts, which can be toxic to the body if they build up. So what the blood does then is it takes those toxins from the cells, carries them to the organs that cleanse, things like the liver, the kidneys, the spleen, the lymphatic system, and then those organs do their job. They take care of those toxins and they eliminate them from the body. And so the blood basically does this over and over again all day long. Now it's a little more complicated than that, but that's basically what's happening there. Now, at the same time, though, what's interesting about this is that there is one part of your body that never has any direct contact with blood whatsoever. And that part of your body is the brain and the spinal cord. Now, you may wonder why that is. Well, that's actually a protective mechanism for your body. We call it the blood-brain barrier. So basically, there's, there's tissues that separate the blood vessels from the structures that hold the brain and the spinal cord. And it only allows certain things to pass through that barrier from the blood and it stops other things. Now, primarily, let's say you had an infection in your blood. Well, you don't want that to go to your brain and spinal cord because obviously that's probably the fastest way to kill you because your brain and spinal cord is what controls everything within your body. And it's what provides the power for everything within you to work properly. So, you, so it's the most important system uh, you want to make sure that there's no way that that can get infected, and that's the main reason for it. So certain things are allowed to pass through, certain things are allowed to pass out into the blood, but there's a wall there that prevents other things from ever touching your nervous system. Okay, so the question is, so if blood is transferring all the oxygen, nutrients, and everything that the body needs to function properly, and if it's eliminating toxin, well, how does the brain and the spinal cord get its nutrients, and how does it eliminate the toxins that it produces when it works? All right, so there's a whole other fluid that we have to talk about called the cerebrospinal fluid. And if you look at the anatomy here, what you're going to find is that your brain is housed within your skull and the spinal cord lives inside of your spine. Now, underneath that layer of bone, there's a tissue called the dura mater. And the dura mater is a protective covering, uh, covering that attaches to the bone. And the brain actually lives inside of there, but there's a fluid in there called the cerebrospinal fluid. And the brain is, is basically floating inside of that fluid. So it never touches the walls or any of the bones that surround it. And this is really important because the brain tissue is very soft. It can be easily damaged. So it needs to float there and not be touched touched by anything. So the cerebrospinal fluid basically functions as the blood for your brain and your spinal cord. It carries oxygen and nutrients to the brain and spinal cord, carries the toxins away. But here's what actually happens. So your blood vessels come up and um, they, there is an exchange that happens between the blood and the cerebrospinal fluid. So the cerebrospinal fluid can take in oxygen and nutrients from the bloodstream and it can 
put its toxins into the bloodstream so that process can continue to be taken care of, but there's never a direct combination there. Now, how does the blood get moved through the body? Well, it's by your heart. Your heart is a pump that's constantly pumping that blood up and down all throughout the body all day long. So is there a pump for the cerebral spinal fluid? Now here's where it gets interesting and here's what he was talking about in his book. The answer is no. So how does the cerebral spinal fluid move so that it can constantly be replenished just like the blood does? Well, it's very interesting and it happens when we breathe. You see, when we breathe, your tailbone, which is the lowest bone in the back, it actually uh, moves slightly. Now this, this movement is so subtle that you actually don't feel it happening. But when I take a breath in, the tailbone moves back slightly. When I breathe out, the tailbone moves forward slightly. And at the exact same time, when I take a breath in, the bones that compose the skull, they actually open up a little bit. Now, this is what's interesting. Everybody thinks that the skull is a solid bone, but it actually is not. We used to believe that um, the bones of the skull, which are all separate bones, we used to believe that they would fuse together as we, get, as we got you know, into our 20s or so. But now we know that that's not the truth, that those bones never completely fuse. There's slight movement that happens there. It's very slight, but there's still movement that happens there. So when I take a breath in, those bones open up a little bit. And when I breathe out, the bones come together again. Now this is important because that dura that I was telling you about is attached to these bones. So when the tailbone is moving slightly and when the skull is opening and closing, it's causing movement in the dura and that creates a pump that moves that cerebral spinal fluid all the way around your brain and your spinal cord. And they say that within 15 hours, that, that fluid has made a complete trek around the entire brain and spinal cord and it's completely refreshed with new oxygen and nutrients and all the toxins have been eliminated and that happens when we breathe. Okay, so this is where I started thinking as a chiropractor because as a chiropractor, what we look at, at is a problem called subluxation. Now, in case you've never seen my videos, let me just briefly tell you what a subluxation is. A subluxation is when any of the vertebrae of the spine move out of their normal position. And I wanna show you what that means. So this would be a, a sample of two vertebrae in your back and you can see how this is put together. So we've got the bones, there's a disc that separates the two bones, and then here you can see where there's an opening where the nerve is exiting the spine. Now your nervous system is composed of the brain, the spinal cord, which lives inside of my spine, and then the nerves which exit my spine and they travel out to the body. Now, the best way for me to just kind of keep this simple is I like to tell people that the nervous system is essentially the electrical system of your body. It's what provides power for everything to work. So what happens is that that electricity starts in the brain, it travels down your spinal cord, out through the nerves, and then those nerves are basically giving power to the body parts. Now what can happen here is that these vertebrae can move out of their normal position. So if you look closely here, this top vertebra can shift backwards. And do you see how when it does that, it puts pressure on this nerve right here? So essentially what that's going to do is that if that vertebra moves out of alignment and if it puts pressure on the nerve, it cuts off the power supply to whatever that nerve is going to. And that's bad, right? So let's say this nerve is going to my heart. Well, I don't want to cut off the power to my heart, correct? I want to make sure that the full power is going there at all times. So what a chiropractor does is we look for these misalignments and we do something called an adjustment, which is very gentle and it helps me to move that vertebra back where it needs to be off of the nerve and all of a sudden the power comes back on and the body starts to function like it's supposed to at that point. Okay, but here's where the story gets interesting. The tailbone is a part of that and the tailbone or the sacrum can misalign as well. And here's what the problem is. When these vertebrae misalign like that, when they become subluxated, they lock, they get locked into place. And that's why we have to actually gently move them because if you don't, they're gonna get stuck there and they're not gonna move properly. So what do you think happens if the tailbone gets locked out of its alignment when we breathe? Do you think it's still able to move? No, it's not. So if I stop the movement of the tailbone, what do you think happens to the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid around the brain and the spinal cord? It slows it down or it stops it sometimes, all right? Now, I want you to realize that the cerebrospinal fluid is essentially feeding the brain and the spinal cord because it's bringing oxygen and nutrients to those cells so that they can work properly. So what do you think happens if you starve the brain and the spinal cord? Well, you're gonna have problems, right? I mean, I don't even like missing a meal, clearly. 
<laughs> but if I cut off the nutrition to my brain and my spinal cord, and if that's not being refreshed the way that it's supposed to be, you're going to start to have a lot of problems with your nervous system. It's not going to function as well. You're going to get cloudy. You're not going to be able to think properly. You may develop symptoms within your body because remember, the brain and the spinal cord are controlling everything and it's providing power for everything to work. So you've got to make sure that it's getting the proper nutrients. So a chiropractor can correct that subluxation of the tailbone. There's another thing that can happen as well, and this is something that people never even think about. I had a patient come in recently, and this is really cool. I'm going to show this picture to you. Uh, she had an MRI done because she was having an issue with her arm. Her arm was not healing, and she had had an injury, and it was months and months ago. And so they were trying to figure out what was going on with it. So she came to me looking for my advice. And they had done an MRI of her neck, and when they, the medical doctors looked at it, they said it was normal. There was nothing wrong. And then I saw this image and I thought, well, there's obviously something wrong. What I want you to notice here is that I want to just kind of point out some structures and then I'm going to tell you what I'm looking at here and what the problem is. And I want you to notice that we're looking at the neck here and you can see the brain on top. You can see the spinal cord passing right down the center there. If you look in front of the spinal cord, you'll see that we have the vertebrae there. And I'm going to highlight all this for you so this is a little bit easier for you. And now I want you to go back and look at the spinal cord again. And I want you to notice that on either side of the spinal cord, there's an area that's white. That's the cerebrospinal fluid that you're seeing there. Now I want you to take a closer look here. Let's, I'm going to go ahead and just show you the top part here. Notice how if I look at the space where the cerebrospinal fluid is around this part of the spinal cord on top, do you notice how it, there's a nice big space on both sides and they're basically even in size, all right? That's normal. That's what is healthy. But then if you go a little bit lower, I want you to look again at the space around the spinal cord where the cerebrospinal fluid is, and I want you to see what's happening in that space there. Do you notice the difference there? What you're going to see is that in that area, this patient has subluxation or misalignment of those vertebrae. They're moving back and they're actually putting pressure against the dura. Okay, and what that's doing is it's closing in on the space where the cerebral spinal fluid is allowed to pass through. Now, in addition to that, when you have a subluxation, it can create a weakness within the discs of the spine because it changes the pressure inside the disc. Now, she's starting to have a little bit of disc herniating going on here. Um, but I want to talk to you again about the cerebral spinal fluid. So, if I close down on that space where the cerebral spinal fluid is allowed to move, what do you think is going to happen there? Well, let's go to a real life example. What if I'm on the expressway and I'm driving somewhere and all of a sudden four lanes goes down to one lane because they're doing road work? It stops the flow of traffic, right? Well, this is the exact same thing that happens in your spine here. If you start to put pressure on the dura and you start to close in on that space where the cerebral spinal fluid is supposed to be flowing, you can have a perfectly functioning tailbone, you can have a perfect, perfectly functioning skull, but it's not gonna matter because it's gonna slow the flow of that fluid through that area and you're gonna have the exact same effect. We don't want anything stopping the flow of that cerebral spinal fluid. We wanna make sure that it continues moving properly so that the brain and the spinal cord can continue to eat and eliminate its toxins properly and so it can work at its best. That's the whole point here. So essentially what we had to do is we had to correct the neck problem realign that vertebra so that the pressure could come off of the dura, open up that space so that the cerebral spinal fluid could start flowing properly again, and now the healing starts to happen, all right? So this is just a real life example of exactly what I'm talking to you about there. Now the question now becomes, well, how do you even know if you have a subluxation? Because what's interesting about the body is that you actually are only designed to feel 10% of what's happening inside of you. We can only feel 10% of the body. 90% we don't feel at all. And that makes sense when you think about it. So for example, I don't want to feel food passing through my digestive system. I don't want to feel blood pumping through all my blood vessels all the time. That would be very distracting, right? And irritating. So you can only feel 10% of what's going on. So 90% of the time, these subluxations can develop and you won't even know that it's happening, all right? Um, you're not going to necessarily have back pain. You're not, not necessarily going to have any type of nerve pain or nerve sensations. So it's important that you have have your spine checked and this is actually why chiropractors in general recommend that people come in even if you're feeling okay just for a checkup to make sure that you don't have subluxations we're the only uh, doctors that look for this problem or even know that it exists all right so what I'm going to encourage you to do is that whether you feel bad or whether you feel good if you've never been checked by your chiropractor now is the time to go get your spine checked 
see if you have subluxations because if these problems are caught early enough, they can be corrected pretty easily. And if you're in my area, you're more than welcome to come visit me. I would love to check your spine to see if everything is normal and healthy there. Um, but if you're not, definitely go see a chiropractor, have your spine checked just to make sure. It's so much, it's so important that you have your spine checked on a regular basis because just like your teeth or anything else, the spine can deteriorate and it can go bad if you don't keep an eye on it. And the chiropractor is where you need to go in order to have that evaluated. All right, guys. Well, that was just my two cents on the topic. I thought it was really an interesting thing that he was talking about, but I wanted to kind of tie in subluxation to that so that you understood that this is a real problem that can cause very serious problems for your nervous system if you don't get it taken care of. All right, I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you on the next video.